So. All right, um, I'll get started. <clears throat> Excuse me. Welcome to the Exeter Historical Society's April virtual program. I'm Laura Martin, a co-executive director of the Historical Society. We are coming to you tonight from the banks of the Squamscott River. I'd like to thank Exeter TV for bringing this program to you through Zoom. We could not do it without them. The program is also being presented on our Facebook page and on Channel 98. Um, a few programming notes. Our scheduled, our originally scheduled April program, Town by Town, Watershed by Watershed, Native Americans in New Hampshire, will be presented instead on Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. As you can see, we like to plan ahead. Our May program is scheduled for, uh, our May program for 2021 is scheduled for Tuesday, May 4th at 7 p.m. After a brief annual meeting, we will hear about Colonial Exeter from UNH professor Cynthia Van Zant. As for tonight, thank you for joining us for our curator and co-executive directors program about World War II and the home front. Tonight, Barbara will be answering questions at the end of the program. Trustee Jillian Price will be monitoring the Q&A dialogue box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type your questions there throughout the program. If you are listening on Facebook, you can write your questions in the, uh, in the comments section and we'll try to get to those as well. If you're interested in learning more about Exeter's history, visit our website, exeterhistory.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, if you're a member of the society, we thank you. Excuse my voice. Um, I don't talk to anyone all day long, so. Uh, and now a brief introduction to tonight's speaker. As I said in January, and it's still true, it's always a pleasure for me to introduce my friend and coworker, Barbara, Barbara Rincunas. Barbara grew up in Falmouth, Maine and earned her BA and MA in history at the universities of Maine and New Hampshire, respectively. In her past lives, she has worked as an archeologist, a high school teacher, and in patient registration at the Exeter Hospital ER. But most importantly to us, she has been the curator at the Exeter Historical Society since 2000. You've probably read her historically speaking columns and or seen her present other programs like January's and or caught her in one, one of our more than 100 Exeter History Minutes. She's pretty awesome. Barbara, take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Um, we were trying to decide what type of program to do, and we remembered that we have a, usually have a workshop program that we present to Exeter High School students, usually 10th uh, graders. And so the materials were all here, and we were ready to go. Our last program was a little bit about World War II. Well, it was entirely about World War II, but it didn't really address what life was like on the home front. So tonight's program is really only going to address what was happening directly in Exeter. So many years ago, we had a volunteer here whose name was Bill Gustin, and he had served in World War II. And we were kicking around ideas one year for a Veterans Day piece. And he, he suggested that World War II didn't start the way you usually see it in documentaries and in films. Usually Pearl Harbor happens and it's almost like America is surprised and suddenly everybody gears up and they, they get going. He said that wasn't true. He said there was a sense that war was inevitable. We knew it was coming. Everyone expected it. And I think that we tend to forget that war had been going on in Europe for quite some time. So by the time it comes to the United States, there were things already happening. So let's see what was going on in Exeter. It's a surprise to many people that selective service or the draft actually started a year before the war began for the United States, before we are involved. The United States had been kicking around the idea of creating a draft in the summer and fall of 1940. You try to picture this happening. It was an election year and it was the summer 
And if there's ever been anything that's been unpopular among Americans, it is the draft. We had a draft during the Civil War, we had a draft during World War I, and it was pretty much universally disliked by everyone. And yet here we are right before a presidential election, and it was a president who was running for an unprecedented third term in office. So there were a lot of people that were wondering if, if this was even okay. And uh, one of the things that he was pushing for was a draft, selective service. And yet it made it through the congressional process and in August, they passed, they managed to pass a select, selective service. And on October 14th, all of the men between the ages of 21 and 35 who were eligible were required to report to the Exeter Town Hall for registration. You can see in this picture, this is in the Exeter Town Hall. The stage is set because the Exeter Players, which was our amateur theater group was, was preparing a program. They were doing a play called Holiday, which was gonna be presented in December. So they were starting to get the sets together for that. I always find that interesting as the background here. And you can see some very unhappy looking young men sitting in the chairs waiting. We still have the same chairs at the, at the uh, <laughs> town hall that you see in this photo. So they were registered for the draft and it only took about a month or two before many men had to begin to report to duty. Here were the classifications that you, you could uh, wind up being <laughs> classified. Uh, the first thing you had to do was of course report to, to get your medical exam. Many of the men went to Mitchell Memorial Hospital which was out in Brentwood at what we today call the, you know, the, the the county nursing home, uh, but that was where they went for their physical. And based on that, and based on their age and what their occupation was, they may be classified in any of these ways. 1A at the very top was welcome to the army. And 4F, which you see at the bottom is men physically, mentally, or morally unfit. That, it's pretty loaded there. And in between, there were all sorts of different categories. It could be someone who's just, you know, not quite ready for service because they haven't quite graduated from high school. Uh, they could be deferred because they had dependent children um, and they aren't in uh, work essential to national defense, or they could be working for the military. If you were working at at um, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, for instance, that was important military work. And so they might get a deferral from there or they would at least get, um, have, to, have to wait. A lot of these classifications change over time. They, initially they were um, only going to draft men between the ages of 21 to 35. Later on, within a year of the war starting, they switched that to ages 18 to 44. So it really did change over time. And you'll notice there's really not much to do with uh, your education. So if you were in the middle of college, too bad. So that was, <laughs> that was the way it went. Um, so the draft was something that a lot of men had to think about. Even boys in high school were considering that this, this was possibly going to happen. It could derail all of their possible plans for the future, their occupation, whatever it was they were planning to do. This is a service flag. If you had family members who were in service, you might have receive something like this to hang in your window. We see these around a little bit sometimes right now, but um, back during the Second World War, this was what you saw in the windows. This is not from Exeter. Uh, just about everything you're gonna see in tonight's program is actually in the collections of the Exeter Historical Society, but I could not find a service flag and my mother had one. This one belonged to my grandmother, my great grandmother, <laughs> excuse me. And she had two sons and two sons-in-law who were serving at that time period. It's blue stars. If you lost your son or your husband or your, your soldier, um, it would change to a gold star, which is where we get the phrase gold star mothers from. The women in town were preparing as well. As early as 1940, the Red Cross Women's um, um, Motor Corps got <laughs> organized. The Red Cross knew that they were going to need transportation services for an, any number of things, just moving people around, moving the canteen around, uh, being able to uh, move soldiers from one place to another or any kind of emergency situation at all. There were going to be fewer men at home to do the job. So in November of 1940, a group of women, mostly 
the wives of Phillips Exeter Academy teachers um, signed up to work for the Red Cross and they began training over by the cage at Phillips Exeter Academy. They had to drive around barrels. They had to be able to parallel park by with barely looking at all. The descriptions that they gave us was that they had to do things like um, practice blackout convoy driving and they drove all the way out to Newcastle in the dark with only half of the headlights showing because we were going to be under blackout conditions. They ferried patients back and forth from uh, Exeter to Boston hospitals. Um, occasionally, they had to move polio patients. This is the polio era. Polio patients out to the Elliott Hospital where they had better breathing apparatus than we had here in Exeter. They were very busy. Um, they did a number of things, including at one point they logged in finding a lost blueberry hunter. So... The Women's Motor Corps, uh, the Red Cross Motor Corps stays in action until well after the war. But of course, war did come. Pearl Harbor happens December 7th, 1941, and Exeter begins to get ready. This is a diary. You're going to see this diary a lot during this evening's program. It belonged to Helen or Betty Krieger, who lived in town. She was, at the time that the war gets started, she is 44 years old. She and her husband, Bob, who have no children, are living on Ash Street. He's kind of a jack of all trades. He gets a job working at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, and she's a piano teacher. So if you happen to be looking at this and you see that there are people's names, as you see on this particular entry where it says, washed odd jobs, and then it's got a couple of kids' names on it, Eleanor and Marjorie. Those are some of her piano students. So she's just jotting in her, in, her jo in her diary who the students are. On this particular day, though, on Thursday, January 15th, she mentions that she goes to a defense meeting in the gym, probably the Talbot gym. At 11 o'clock, that wasn't Talbot gym, that wasn't built yet, sorry. Defense meeting in the gym, let's just leave it at that. At 11 o'clock, she saw three movies of the bombing of London and a demonstration of an incendiary bomb in the cage. And then she just writes, we walked home. Because if that's not enough to keep you up nights, I don't know what is. There was a great deal of concern on the east coast of the United States that the Germans might be able to fly this far and actually do the same type of terror campaign on the United States east coast that they might, that they did in London. And so there was a great deal of concern about what to do about air raids. Helen or Betty Krieger, nobody knows her as Helen. Betty Krieger um, really took this to heart and she realized that she was going to have to participate in this process of civil defense. Air raid, the, the town was broken into wards and air raid wardens were set up. When I do this with students, it's fun if they live in Exeter and they know where their uh, address is and where it might have been in the 1940s, because there are some new streets now, but if they live on one of the older streets, to look it up and see if they can find out who was the air raid warden for their particular streets. If you'll notice, if you can see these closely, that it's a mix of men and women um, that really did, wasn't a particularly gendered role that uh, either one could do it. They did have to be adults, however. And there's also information on how to make your blackouts for your windows, because when there was an air raid, all the lights went out. We tried to make ourselves not a target. And if we weren't a target, there was some concern that we might lead the way to Portsmouth, because the shipyard was considered a target. And it was felt by a lot of people that that was what the problem could be. You'll see on the side there, that is my absolute favorite um, Headline of all times from the Exeter newsletter, surprise blackout next week. So be ready for it, because it's a surprise. When it did happen, I think it was in May, uh, when the blackout did happen uh, in May, they, they had all the sirens go off and uh, Betty mentions that it was about 10 p.m. that they did it and it lasted about 40 minutes. Um, so they did a lot of drills. Uh, they were very concerned that, that we were going to have air raids here. There were even ads in the newspaper about what to do for your pet if there was an air raid. With very little radar in the area, it was really in its infancy at that time, the only way to look for planes was to physically go out there and look for them. So volunteers were recruited to be plane spotters, to, to form a, a kind of a ground observatory group. And they set up posts all along the East Coast. There was one at Stratham Hill Park. There was one at Shaw's Hill in Kensington. 
And in Exeter, they actually set up their observation post at the Robinson Female Seminary Tower. There it is. It was one of the highest points in town, had four windows in the cupola, and that's where the plane spotters would do their job. They volunteered for two hour shifts during daylight hours only. There was a, an amplification system set up inside so that you could really hear the planes quite well and you had were given binoculars to look through and that identification guide that, you, that I just showed is what people would use to try and identify planes. Betty Tufts volunteered. She was usually out there on Thursdays in the afternoon, which should have been a very busy time. There's a full account of being a plane spotter in Exeter that was written up in the Exeter newsletter, and it was written by Warren Kellogg. He was a plane spotter, and his shift was on Sunday mornings from 8 until 10. It was a really quiet time of day, hardly ever got to see a plane. When they did hear or see a plane, they had to figure out what direction it was coming from, whether it was a friendly plane or whether it was possibly an enemy plane, and they had to call it in to, um, to report it and then they logged it in. And of course, there was some no small amount of competition between people who saw the most planes and, and were they able to identify it? In, in Betty's diary, she wrote that somebody caught her plane before she got it. She's most annoyed with it. This is my favorite entry though, because what happens is over time, it is discovered that the original people recruited for this job, who were adults um, primarily, um, and they thought, you know, we'll get World War I veterans, they're military men, they'll be able to do it. We'll get some of the housewives who are home all day, and perhaps their kids are in school so they can, they can watch out for planes. But it turned out that these, these folks just weren't all that great at it. And you can see on March 18th, on the Thursday, she's supposed to have her shift and she doesn't go because she's, she's not feeling well that week. I think she goes to the doctor the next day, but she had subs. So it says had subs up in the tower. They got plenty of planes, RS girls, I guess. So it's actually the Robinson Seminary girls because they discovered that the people who were really good at plane spotting were the teenagers, high school boys from Exeter High School and girls from Robinson Seminary. They would pair them up so they'd have a partner and they'd go up there and they would they would find the planes. They, you know what? Teenagers just have better hearing and vision than 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 people who were older than that. So poor, poor Betty. I think she felt like she was outclassed by the kids. Um, but she did, she did fairly well. Every now and then you, you'll see an entry in her diary where she's seen a plane. Meanwhile, there were jobs everywhere. You remember, we're just coming out of the Great Depression and in the Exeter, New Hampshire, and New Hampshire in general, the economy had been depressed for years, much longer than just the, what we call the Great Depression. So I mean, there's jobs everywhere. This is just one example from the Exeter newsletter advertisement. And this is from the Exeter Manufacturing Company. That was a textile mill. They did not mind who you were, male or female, no special skill necessary, apply at the Exeter Manufacturing Company. Also places to work were the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. That's where Betty's husband, Bob, got work during the war. He stays there for a little while after the war. The Exeter Handkerchief Factory, which is over by the railroad station today. There were shoe shops in town and, of course, the Exeter Brass Works. Now, transportation was quite limited. So if you wanted to work at the Naval Shipyard, in a way, you were lucky because they ran buses out to the neighboring towns to make sure that all of their employees could get there. So that was also quite helpful. Exeter Brass Works actually was awarded uh, and. Uh, what's called the E, which meant that they were had gained a certain level of excellence. And it was a big to-do that went on in town. And it was in the paper all the time um, for their war work. But the real problem that people on the home front, if, if they're working all the time, they finally have enough money, uh, but food is immediately uh, rationed quite early on. The first thing that happens in the New England area is that sugar becomes <laughs> very scarce. 
And I don't know if you can believe this, but whenever you hear that something might become scarce, your first inclination is to go out and buy as much of it as you possibly can. I know this just seems very remote to all of us now, but one of the things people were worried about was sugar. And so people started buying up as much sugar as they can, not just because we have a constant American sweet tooth, but because anybody who was going to be making jams and jellies in the summer was also really worried that they might not have it. So they begin hoarding sugar. And you can see places like the Exeter Food Center was actually offering a premium. They'll pay you 10 cents a pound for it, and then they're going to sell it for 7 cents a pound. But they want people to stop hoarding it. Um, so they're, they're doing their best to try and lure customers in for their other low prices so that they can get enough sugar. In 1941, in the spring of 1942, sugar starts to become scarce. It's hard to find but they didn't really start rationing until a little while later. But ration they do is the only way to deal with the problem. Here's Betty again, and she is writing. Let's see why I pulled this one down. She's doing her usual work, and it says, went after sugar ration book at RS. <laughs> with her at six. Okay. Uh, so she goes down to, uh, to get your ration books. They were um, administered at the local schools, the public schools. In Exeter, that seems to have primarily been at the Robinson Seminary. It was the center of town. It was a good place for people to be able to get in. Oh, there's her surprise blackout at 10 p.m. There we go. It was May 5th. Um, so she had to go pick up her ration book, and the first ration book that was issued was a sugar ration book. Not really much of a book, it's really just a page, and you can barely read it, but this is the sugar ration book of Thaddeus Klamarzik, who lived over on Hobart Street, and he didn't even use all of his sugar ration coupons. That's probably because shortly after they started to issue these, they, they come out with a new rationing system. The other things that were rationed in New England, uh, gasoline gets rationed very early. Um, it's actually months before it gets rationed in other parts of the country. On the East Coast, there was a concern that there would not be enough gasoline to go around. This does not turn out to be the problem. Gasoline is heavily, heavily rationed, but it's not because there was any kind of shortage. The shortage actually was for the tires. Since the war erupts in the Pacific, any products that were produced in the Pacific, the South Pacific or in Asia, or even in South America where there was frequently blockades and you couldn't get through, all of those products were gonna be in short supply. So things like rubber and coffee and tea, um, all of those products um, are gonna be hard to get. So how do you keep people from using up their tires? Don't let them drive. Do you just forbid them to drive? No, just don't give them enough gas. And that was actually how it worked. Here's the home front calendar from the very end of 1942. This was published in the newspaper. Boy, I cannot use scissors. I should have cut that out better. But anyway, um, they're just letting you know what coupons you're going to be able to use. Because the rationing system, you not only paid for things, but you also had to give a, a coupon that said that you, you were allowed to get it. So here's the new regulations that are going to come out starting in January of 1943. All cars have to have an initial tire inspection, and then your cars were classified. Um, as to how you were going to use them, okay? So um, if, you, if your car was classified as A, it was a pleasure car. You didn't, you didn't really need it, is what they're telling you. <laughs> your car would have a placard in the dashboard that had the letter A on it. And in 1942 and 43, you were allowed four gallons of gas per week. And if you're wondering to yourself, well, that doesn't seem like very much. Maybe cars had much better gas mileage back then. Nope. Cars back then got uh, somewhere between 13 and 15 miles per gallon. So what they're doing is they're keeping people at that point in time down to about 60 miles, maybe, maybe about 50 miles a week. 
So try doing that sometime. I realized that we were all driving less right now, but it was even, even less back then. That amount of gas actually gets lowered to two gallons per week and eventually down to 1.5 gallons per week. So if you had a, a job that wasn't considered important to the war effort and you just owned a car so you could tootle about town and visit your friends and go for pleasant drives up and down Rye Beach, forget it, not anymore. If your car was classified as B, then you were probably a war worker. That meant that you had a job that was essential and you needed to get back and forth to your job and you got a whopping eight gallons a week. People were encouraged to do a lot of carpooling at that point in time. Hospital workers, farm workers, construction workers were all considered essential. They had a, a letter C. And then there was the letter X classification, which was a VIP pass, unlimited. Uh, Congress people got these. There's a lot of discontent over those. And of course, emergency vehicles, off-road farm vehicles, truckers, all had no restrictions on the amount of gas they could buy. Remember, gas rationing was really done to control uh, the use of rubber uh, to keep the tires uh, useful. Um, we'll talk about scrapping in a little while uh, from now, but that's where you're looking. So, and here you're seeing that you can get um, limits on sugar, coffee. Your war ration book is going to be coming in. This is book one. This was the first one that was issued. It's really just a big piece of paper folded into quarters. And on the inside, you had to put all of your important information. I'm sure that Margaret Dufault, who I think is 14 years old at this point in time. She's probably thrilled to know that we have her height and weight on here. But you can see the war ration stamps are numbered, and that's all they had to them. It wasn't a point system. It would just say, you know, here's, here's what, what coupon you could use. It was going to be, it's listed in the newspaper what coupon is used for what. People were allowed, for instance, two pairs of shoes per year. Uh, but it didn't include, you know, like little kids' shoes. If it was under a size four infant shoe, then those were unlimited because kids' feet grow in their sleep. Play shoes were also not, not really um, rationed at the time. You know, you put your kid in sneakers and hopefully they'll just run around outside. Slippers weren't counted. Rubbers weren't counted. Uh, any kind of shoe that had a wooden sole wasn't rationed. Uh, but you did have to get approval if you wanted high rubber boots. Because again, rubber, it's hard to get that. The things that were hard to find in Exeter, clearly Betty had a hard time trying to find butter. You can see about the third entry down, it says got one pound butter at Ames at 1130 with an exclamation point. There's another day where she waits in line for a long time. It's almost an hour and a half where she waits in line just to get a half a pound of butter. A half a pound of butter is two sticks of butter. And that was supposed to last her a week or so in a time period when you don't have no stick pans. Um, so they really needed it. And it was hard for people to get used to this. They were used to having food available all the time. She's also annoyed here where she says it's just gonna get only sausage. Things she didn't have trouble getting, probably because we lived in New England. Um, there are a lot of farmers around, but she seems to be able to get her hands on eggs at any time. So there was not a lot of powdered eggs being eaten in the New England area. Uh, a lot of people bought chickens too, so they could supplement their own, um, their own purchases at the store. And you, those things weren't, they, they weren't rationed at all. Okay, here's... War Ration Book 2, which comes out shortly after War Ration Book 1, and they overlap. So if you have a family of five, okay, so it's mother, father, three children, we'll pretend that that's the nuclear family back then, um, you're, you're juggling. And it's usually mom who's got all these ration books she's trying to figure out. Sometimes she would, she would push that task onto the kids. See how many we're going to need for this and figure out the shopping list and you're juggling all these books and sometimes you had several different editions of it because they overlapped and it's also very obvious that when you went to get your new edition of the book you didn't have to turn in your old one we know that because we have stacks of ration books in our collections all from exeter and they give us a lot of information about people about what the coupons looked like ration book two this is the only one out of probably about 10 or 15 of Coupon book two, this is the only one that has any of the coupons left over. You can see that in the second book, they're designating it by numbers and by letters. So you had to buy something and the point system might mean so many points, but it might be a specific coupon. And that was just to keep things under control. 
Here's ration book three, back to the Klamarzik family again. This time it's Janet. Each member of the family had their own book. So even children. This ration book had tiny little, tiny, tiny little coupons. Each one had a different war weapon on it. You can see there's tanks, there's uh, an aircraft carrier, there's just all sorts of as an airplane on one. They all have different numbers on them. This is a very complex system. You were supposed to go into the store and when you purchased your goods, the uh, merchant was actually the person who was supposed to cut the coupons out. You weren't supposed to rip them apart at all because they had to prove it was you and for your family. I don't know how well that went. And then every week you check the newspaper to see what was available, or if it was available, how much it would cost you. And you can see that the coupon points are frequently quite high. Dried beef, dried chip beef is uh, pretty high on the list, 12 points at this point in time. And this is, I think, 1943. You'll notice that it doesn't list eggs on here. It doesn't seem to be rationed in the area. Um, potatoes was another thing you could always get, potatoes and apples in the New England area. But there were a lot of things that that word tough, yeah, you know, bacon. This was a hard thing for people to live with. People were used to having eggs and bacon in the mornings. In fact, many people had meats in the morning until World War II. And after that, it kind of falls by the wayside. And you see more packaged uh, cereals that become more popular after the war. But it's all a very complicated process. Back to the Lamarzics. Here's our. Uh, War coupon book number four, and these particular coupons are um, th mostly they're, they're sort of patriotic symbols. There's also sheaves of wheat that you'll see in here and the spares that you see in there. They actually have coffee coupons left over, which must have been a tremendous thing for them. <laughs> Most of the time you, you needed coffee very badly. There were also these tiny little coins. There are red ones and blue ones. I don't have any blue ones in our, in our collections. But you can see that um, Puritan clothing stores from Portsmouth was giving out these little envelopes. We have a few of them for you to store your, your little coins in. This was when you, know, you needed like nine points for something and you only had an eight point coupon. You could supplement it with one of these little coins. They're made out of a kind of a cardboard type substance. They're very sturdy. And of course you could also buy a ration book holder. We have lots of different things. Not too dissimilar from what we're going through today where everybody seems to have a different style of mask and how they keep it and maintain it. Um, so it's always fun to see how they do it. The one at the bottom left where you can see the ration book right through it. That was somebody put that one together themselves with tape and, and some plastic and they kept all their ration books inside. We even have one that is stitched leather in our collection. Here's the Exeter Food Center down on uh, Water Street, and they are trying to remind people that maybe 1944 will go better. In the meantime, you can use LMNPQ and spare number one, because they're going to run out this week, so you better get going. Fuel oil was also rationed. Here's someone, this is actually a family that starts out in Massachusetts, but they do move to Exeter, I promise. And you had to buy your fuel oil. Uh, it was also carefully rationed. At one point, um, Betty Krieger does run out of fuel oil and she has to go down to the ration board, which was located in the Merrill block. And she had to try and apply for more and basically say, we, we don't have any heat right now. What do we do? And the next heating season, she's much more careful. They insulate the house over the summer. They start to use the, um, the fireplace in one of the rooms. She mentions, she had never mentioned it before, but she starts mentioning in her diary that they made a fire and it was cozy. So people did learn to adapt to this, this new reality that uh, things weren't going to be available exactly when they wanted them and that their life was just going to have to change. And in the meantime, everybody's working. And if they're not working at a war job or their own job, they may be volunteering for any number of um, related services in town. So people were quite busy and they were saving money. World War II was primarily paid for through war loans, uh, through the bond drives that you see. Even children were encouraged to save and buy bonds. What you see in the one side there is a little savings book 
the kids were encouraged to bring in 25 cents to school and then they'd get a stamp and they put it in this book. And when the book was filled, you could take it down to the post office and the post office would issue you a bond. And so everyone participated. If you wanted to reach your servicemen, the most um, efficient way to do it was through something called V-mail. Now, strangely enough, there's, we don't have any V-mail in our collections here at the Exeter Historical Society, but my mother has quite a stash at her house, so I went up to visit her last week. V-mail, you had a, a you, it was an authorized by the United States government, and you wrote it out on this large sheet of paper. You can see it's, it's carefully designed so that you have to write inside the lines. It encourages you right on it to write clearly, plain letters in the panel below. Make sure you do it clearly or type it. I'm surprised my grandmother wasn't typing her letters because she was a professional typist, but she, her handwriting's not too bad. It's quite readable. It's no worse than Betty Tufts, uh, Betty Krieger. And then what they would do is they would photograph, first it would go to the censors and then it would get photographed and only the negatives would be shipped overseas. So what my grandfather would receive after she wrote this letter would be something that you see right next to it, which is that tiny piece. So it went from uh, being like nine inches uh, across to being about four inches across. That's why you needed to write as clearly as possible. Actually, the small one there is one that my grandmother received from him and uh, his handwriting was pretty good too. And he wrote back, uh, he was in Italy. I'm not sure if he was in Italy at the time. Yes, he was. Um, so uh, these came across. So the reason that we still have the large one is because by the end of the war, they had stopped doing this and they were just mailing them through the regular post, but they were still using up the old forms. And before this, you didn't have to put postage on it, which was nice, but this one does have postage on it. So underneath where I have carefully covered it, uh, there's a big piece chomped out of it because my father was collecting stamps. So he cut the stamps off of all of these things. But generally it was a good system because the censors could look at it. They didn't have to open up a lot of mail and it would prevent any kind of um, sneaking across. You know, it was it was just carefully done. <laughs> it was very secure. It foiled any invisible ink that might have been getting through any espionage or, or whatever. Uh, so look through your records, and as you see, you've got stacks of these tiny little postcard-sized uh, letters, and you're wondering what they're all about. That's that's V mail. Now, there were a lot of other things that could be done. In, in many ways, you could say that teenagers saved the town because they did an awful lot of work in town. Teenagers are uh, very capable of doing a lot of things. Uh, the boys aren't quite ready yet to go off to the war, although they're thinking about it. And the girls have plenty of time and they're very capable of doing many different things. So the boys are trying to finish school. The high school adapted itself, the boys' high school. Remember, we have three different schools going in Exeter at this time. We have Phillips Exeter Academy, which is sort of college prep and it's a, um, it's a boarding school, all boys. We had Exeter High School, which was the town's boys and a lot of the local towns all fed into Exeter High School. And then we had the Robinson Female Seminary, which is where the girls went to high school. So the kids were all separated most of the time. But when it came to war work, they were needed everywhere. Um, the boys who weren't busy in school, uh, the hours changed. So they got out at 1.30 in the afternoon. They uh, adapted a lot of the mechanical arts programs uh, in an attempt to get them ready for possible service. A lot of boys were going to they were considering going into the Air Force or the Navy, those are fairly specialized. And so they knew they were going to need certain skills. So they, they adapted in that way. The seminary uh, for the girls also adapted. It taught an awful lot of first aid and um, home economics because they were needed um, you know, to, to do more canning, to produce your own food. Boys cleared snow on the streets and the sidewalks and the railroad. They took first aid classes. Both genders participated in plane spotting. I haven't found any uh, Phillips Exeter Academy kids working up in the tower uh, spotting planes, but the boys from PEA were encouraged to help with other tasks. They did a lot of snow removal as well. And then the apple crop came in. We have several large orchards right in the area and the students were needed to bring the crops in. First, it was offered to the Phillips Exeter Academy students 
who were generally happy to sign up because they actually got out of classes for it, uh, which was helpful. The Exeter High School boys were generally so busy doing other town tasks, they didn't spend a lot of time in the in the orchards, but they, they did. And the Robinson Seminary girls, this is a photo of the uh, of some girls getting getting ready to leave. To, they're getting on the Applecrest truck. Nice, safe transportation, standing upright in a truck all the way out to Hampton, uh, <laughs> or Hampton Falls. Uh, that's the way it was done. I, I got to give them credit. I, I'm sure I would have worn pants, and some of them were wearing skirts. And eventually, they started letting the Boy Scouts in on the deal. Uh, if they turned 14, they were brought out to the fields, and they were allowed to camp out for two weeks, which must have been a lot of fun. I'd love to hear from any men uh, who, who participated in that. That would be great to hear about. Of course, food production was important. When possible, people were encouraged to grow their own food. Not really a problem in a place like New Hampshire. People had been gardening for a long time and it just was, so I don't, I haven't found any evidence that certain areas were laid out as uh, extra places to grow food. I think most people had a yard or a backyard or, or could sort of take over some space and grow their own food, but they definitely did. Um, things that had to be conserved were meats, coffee, tea, some canned goods were hard to find, oils and butter could be in short supply. The cooperative extens extension out of Univer uh, University of New Hampshire, ably led by Ruth Stimson, um, she, went, she taught an awful lot of classes in canning and food preparation. We had a short season, but people gardened a lot. Um, they had meatless options. They learned to substitute things that they couldn't get for things that they could. If you've ever tried cooking a mayonnaise cake, I encourage it. We have the recipe, and I had occasionally, we've, we've had high school kids that have tried it. <laughs> There's also meatless meatloaf, which has a lot of lentils in it, just to be forewarned, a lot of rice in it, uh, you know, products that they didn't have much trouble finding, things that we could produce in the United States. So there was a lot of creative substitution that went on. It's not really fun and games that I mean, you can't get a birthday cake, that kind of stinks. So what did they do if they didn't have enough coffee and tea? I mean, you'd think, okay, I know it's gonna be in short supply, so I'll just wean myself off the caffeine, it will be fine, right? You can do it if you have to. But people were working crazy hours. You know, uh, Betty's husband, Bob, was working night shifts out at the, at the shipyard. So you really, you kind of needed that thing. Coca-Cola sweeps in at this time and really takes advantage of this to say, well, look, you don't have any coffee. So why don't you try drinking Coca-Cola? Because it will perk you up. So there's heavy advertising for Coca-Cola in all of the newspapers that you see at this time period. And um, it seems like it was a very popular product. <laughs> The war goes on, and as the war goes on, some fatigue sets in. People get tired. They're saving everything. There's scrap metal drives that go on consistently. You see them all through the newspaper. Boy Scouts assisted with that as well, where they just collected every bit of metal that you might have around the house. Any old tire had to be saved. Paper was bailed up. Um, steel and tin cans were saved and flattened and brought in. And after a certain amount of time, you just get tired of all these restrictions. And so it was a constant need to encourage people. The Exeter Food Center, this is a, um, an advertisement really from, from later in the war by about 1944, late 1944, early 1945. I mean, things are getting scarce. And here they are advertising, listen, you just got to be patient. You know, remind the public we're going to have to go through our hardest periods, meat scarcity in the past, past few weeks. So they don't have much. They're putting out even the parts of the, of the, of the animals, uh, you know, the meats that, that people don't usually like, the liver and kidneys, feet, heads, sparrows, all that kind of junk meat. They're putting it out as they have it. But try not to buy it. It ends at the very end. Again, it's that hoarding issue. Um, if you are accustomed in the past to buy a pound of steak at a time, don't buy three pounds just because you see it in the case. I can't imagine what people would do that. Um, so they're encouraging people to do that. And they're reminding women, uh, you can see in this advertisement, we're very used to the Rosie the Riveter advertisement that you see. I found this one in the Exeter newsletter. 
And this is this is not a woman who's working in a factory. She is at home and she is a very capable looking woman at home. And what she's doing is she is collecting all of her fats. You'd collect all the drippings that you could find if you didn't need them. Because as I said, oil and butter were hard to find. And you'd collect all of these things and you could drop it off at the grocery store just to do your bit. Okay, the war does end. This was the display that was put up in front of the Exeter Courthouse, which was right in the downtown of Exeter, where today there is a lovely drive through bank. The big V for victory is standing in front of the town's service flag. Service flag would constantly count up the number of people in service and how many we had lost. And so that flag, there was actually a couple of them that existed in town. They were always privately purchased and donated, usually by some sort of um, fraternal organization. And I would love to find out whatever happened to it. The last time I've seen a photo of this, it's in the new Talbot gym that was built in the 1950s. But I don't know what happens to it after that. If we're lucky, it's just folded up somewhere in town in an attic of some big building and we'll locate it. But we don't have the service flags and it would be good to, to find that little artifact, well, big artifact actually, if you look at the size of it and, and locate it in the town. This was displayed in August of 1945 after the war ended. And it was after that, of course, that the men come home. Um, they put up a, a more permanent display in front of the courthouse. It had most of the men in it. Um, eventually this deteriorates by the 1960s and it just kind of falls apart on its own. But returning soldiers had a lot of issues to deal with. Um, many of them uh, had, had to figure out how to pick up their lives. A uh, few had in, enlisted early in the war, you didn't necessarily come home, and it was four or five years. A lot of men uh, thought they'd go back to school. The GI Bill was fairly generous. But there were a lot of men who had left school before they had even completed high school. You had to get permission to do this, but if you were at least 17 years or so, or turned 18, or were close enough to that, sometimes you could get permission to join up. And there were quite a few men who didn't finish high school. When the school year starts in 1946, there were an awful lot of men who actually contacted the school to find out how they could get their high school diploma. Maybe they wanted to take advantage of a college education or to go on to a further education. They needed that high school diploma to prove it. Some of them tested out, meaning that they managed to fulfill all the requirements simply through testing. But as the, uh, the school department finally set up a, a, a kind of a graduate program. They weren't graduates, but they were veterans. And some of these men were in their 20s by this time. I mean, think of how awkward it would be if you left high school when you were 17 or 18, then you go off to war. You're not a boy when you go off to war. You come back an adult, and you have seen all sorts of things happen, and you've seen people from all over the world, perhaps traveled far, and then you have to come back and go back to high school where you're sitting in a class, a geometry class with a bunch of kids. That was awkward. But they managed to iron it out and offered programs, and in 1947, there were 13 graduates who, um, veteran graduates who got their diplomas that year. And um, it was a very successful program. A lot of businesses were encouraged to hire veterans, even if they hadn't earned their high school diploma, figuring perhaps their time in the service had, had done enough. The other legacies left over from all of this home front activity. Uh, I mentioned Ruth Stimson from the Cooperative Extension. She started her job in the Cooperative Extension in 1941 during World War II, and she stayed in it. She started in 1942. She was there for 40 years. And over the years, her job changed from canning and preservation and making over clothes to the 1950s, where it became more of a, a, a job working with civil defense. Everything was about preparedness in the 1950s. So people were learning how to make one pot meal. We had a couple of hurricanes that came through in the 50s too. So I think it really reminded people that they needed to be prepared for all sorts of events. Um, she taught them one pot meals. There was encouragement, especially during the Cold War to build outside cooking 
um, areas, so with cinder blocks and bricks, and they turned out to be just a real boon for barbecuing <laughs> and summer activities. It was a very popular program. She taught people about, uh, then it changed from there, and after that, that uncomfortable uh, times during the Cold War, as people relaxed a little more, it became home decorating, making over your clothes, child craft, uh, which is how to raise children because the baby boom happens after World War II. Babysitter's training was, was taught to um, girls and young women, uh, nutrition programs to feed your, your family well. And that really is all leftovers from the time period during uh, the war when, when all of these things were going. The civilian ground observation corps also existed after the war where they were also watching for planes it's sort of a holdover from the plane spotting days and i think that's all we have and it's almost eight o'clock so i'm going to open it up to questions let's see what jillian can have for me and we'll see what i can answer <laughs> all right can you hear me i can hear you fine excellent all right our first question which i really like is if there is all of this sugar rationing, where is Coca-Cola getting all of their sugar? Ah, they were exempt because they were manufacturing and because they provided it to the troops. <laughs> yes, this is a thing. If you cannot sell your product to the public, you can sell it. <laughs> That's why it's in short supply for a lot of regular American citizens because uh, places like Coca-Cola had it. Yeah. Okay? All right. Uh, Jackie Jandrin would like to know, if we have any instances that we know of of people in Exeter being fined for rationing violations. I don't know if they were fined, but there were episodes where people were in trouble for violating rationing rules. Most of the time, it was done kind of the way people do things now when they work under the table. They didn't get caught at it very often. So, you know, it'd be like, you know, you need some eggs, you know, yeah, you need some more coffee? Well, I don't really drink coffee, but I have all these coffee coupons. But you had to go down and buy it yourself. And then if you wanted to give it to your neighbor, you could probably do that. I mean, yes, people cheated on rationing. Yes, there's, there's no way around that fact. But on the whole, I think I was uh, reading something about like 85% like of the people just, just obeyed the rules because you were all in it together. So you had to just kind of go along with it. All right, folks, send in your questions now. Those are the two. So you're going to have to deal with the questions from me, which, as Barbara knows, is going to be about, well, no, it's just I'm just going to ask about the knitting for the troops aspect. And uh, Yeah, I didn't see that as much during World War II as I see during World War I. Mm -hmm. During World War I, it's in the newspapers constantly, and during the Civil War, too, is knitting for the troops. Uh, because they just did not like the government issued socks and such. I haven't seen too much for that um, in World War II. I'm sure it happened, but I didn't see all that much. You'd have to look it up. I'm sure they were knitting balaclavas for people in Europe and such. Yeah, I have some books that I, <laughs> digital books. Not so all the but um, I don't know about an accident either, so that'd be interesting to look into. All right, someone would like to know, uh, Tom would like to know what happened to the Robinson Seminary. The Robinson Seminary uh, merged with Exeter High School in the 1950s, and the building existed until about 1961, and then there was a tremendous fire. It caught fire and it burned to the ground. It stood roughly behind the Lincoln Street School today. I have one photograph where I have both schools in the photo, but they didn't exist together very long because Lincoln Street School gets built right before the seminary burns. So it's gone, unfortunately. It would have been a great landmark for us. Thank you. Right. Susan Wakefield would like to know what products did uh, Exeter manufacture for the war effort, if any? What, what, I'm what sorry. What products did um, Exeter factories manufacture for the war effort specifically? The brass works. I'm not sure exactly what the brass works was making. It could have been parts of things that became larger things. I know that's not very helpful, but. Um, Sometimes you didn't know uh, what you were actually making. I'm sure they did, but um, 
Peter Smith was here, he would be able to answer that immediately because his family was involved with the brass works quite heavily. Exeter Manufacturing Company, of course, made textiles and sheeting. The handkerchief factory made um, handkerchiefs for the different service. Maybe there's no disposable tissues back then. And um, they said that the best ones went to the Navy. And uh, Don wants to know what the population was in Exeter about that time. No, oh, population of Exeter about that time is probably around 5,000. It's not that large, actually. It's about 3,000 in the 19 teens, and it goes down a little bit in the 1920s, but I think it had rebounded by that time. So it may be, you know, four or 5,000 people. I, I just would have to look that one up. Okay. And um, just for me, thinking about that time, it's quite small, honestly. Yeah. And it has its own plane spotting. Does every town have a plane spotting, essentially, or is it... Just no, they were just trying to get a long line of them along the coast. Okay. So yeah. Anybody that had a high spot in town. I mean, Kensington is much smaller than Exeter, and they yeah. had one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good for them. All right, John Ring would like to know, did Betty Krieger mention whether her father had gas rationing? He was a traveling salesman, so this would definitely have impacted him. Betty... Krieger's father was a professor at the academy, and I think he's also deceased at this point. So I'm not sure who we're talking about, but a traveling salesman falls into the same category. Let me find my list here, because I remember putting the putting those uh, traveling salesmen, which were very important. I mean, we think of traveling salesmen today as something from the music man who's always trying to cheat you out of your money, but actually they were, they were necessary um, going from town to town to move their products around. Let me see if I can find where they were. Ah. Salesmen fall into the same category as the hospital workers, farm employees, and construction workers. So they are the ones that get about eight gallons a week, and they could always apply for extra if they needed it. So if you got into a pinch, I mean, you were, they weren't going to let anybody starve. If you really ran out of things, you could go down to the uh, ration board office, and you could appeal it. And they might sometimes issue you a little more and then remind you that you were... <laughs> didn't need quite that much. <laughs> yes, but he's an essential employee. And I, right. I see John has commented again, as you yeah, meant, he he found her, brother, her brother, Jim, and Thomas Tuft says- Oh, brother like, Jim, who, yeah, okay. Got Thomas it. Tuft says you could travel by train instead of car as well. So we do have a train, go straight into Boston. So that would have been very helpful. Yeah, people were really encouraged to use any kind of public transportation that they could. Uh, there was a bus, service that went out to Hampton Beach from here as well. So you could you could go to the beach still, uh, but they would discourage you from driving your own car. Public transportation was a better way to go. So there's a lot of using the environment in a shared way that I think people had not really encountered before that. And you know, just reading the um, accounts of the scrap metal drives where people have to are encouraged, go up to your attic, find any old junk. And I'm thinking, boy, that would be a great clear out. We should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Just get all that junk out of everywhere. <laughs> Goodbye to all of the lovely cast iron fences. Yeah, they're gone now. Yeah. And then, yeah, one of the things we lost, we had a big cast iron watering trough that used to stand in the center of town by the bandstand. And when they built the bandstand, they moved it in front of the town hall. And then eventually they move it up to the west end of town. And that's the last time we see it is a photograph from the 1930s. And when I asked Thelma Barlow if she ever remembered seeing it, she said, oh, that was scrapped during World War II. So there were some things that we would today probably try to preserve, but at this time it was an emergency and people did what they needed to do. So that's what happens sometimes. Makes sense. Hey, on the topic of public transit, do you know if the train schedules were reduced or reorganized in any way? I don't read any accounts of the train schedule being changed at this time period. And they used to post the train schedules in the newspapers for a long time. So I don't recall it. anything. Um, what did I see on the B&M? The one thing I saw on the B&M Railroad was they showed photographs of, uh, of women doing the actual train cleaning so that in between stations, they would be on there with the broom. So that was another kind of sort of a war effort, but it was the kind of job that, that women had to jump into when all the men were gone. Just just something as basic as sweeping out the, the train, the rail cars. So that was a little bit different. 
I don't see any more questions here in the Zoom, so now is the time, folks. Uh, <laughs> checking over on Facebook. Um, no other questions there either. So. All right, very good. Anything well, else y'all want to add? <laughs> any other nuggets of information you can throw at us? <laughs> you can always send us an email, info at exeterhistory.org, and we'll tell you uh, mostly about the town of Exeter. Remember, we're a little bit limited that way, but we might be able to help you with some background information. Thank you all for coming and seeing us tonight. We appreciate you being here. Laura, do you want to have any final words? Just to reiterate what you said, thank you, and we hope to see you next.